<laughs> there, everybody, is the helmeted guinea fowl, a spectacular species found much of the way through Africa. That is not why we're here, of course. There are the wildebeest, and they're now thinking again of coming across the river. They've been milling around here. A few of them have headed off to the left. They've turned around. They've made a few bleating sounds. They've turned back. And now it looks as if they might approach the river again. Now, I'm inexperienced in these things. I don't know if they're going to cross the river or not. Mr. Wallington on camera today says, Well, when you have wildebeest at a river, a crocodile and a dead wildebeest, you can be sure that something is about to happen. Ergo, we are still here, we have not moved. Now, while we wait to see these indecisive animals and whether they will or will not decide to have a swim on this very warm and pleasant afternoon here in Kenya. Yes, that's what I said, Kenya in the Mara Triangle. I would like to send out a very special shout out to Joanne McCulloch that comes from everyone at Wild Earth um, who sent through a very kind message today about the joy that Wild Earth gives her. She's having a bit of a tough time health-wise at the moment and so we wish you all the very best Joanne and we hope that this unbelievable scene, an ancient landscape and an ancient dance that has been taking place for goodness knows how many millennia, we hope it gives you some joy and strength as you forge ahead with your difficulties. So good luck. Now, you can see they're getting a little bit sort of, um, a little bit kind of uneasy. Well, Miss Lynn, you want to know what I'm smelling. You're in North Carolina. Well, my proximity to the cameraman, Graham Wallington, <laughs> means that that's largely what I'm smelling, and it has been a long day in the car. Um, <laughs> I am talking rubbish, Miss Lynn. It smells... You know what? It smells kind of... I mean, I don't, and I don't mean this in a bad way. It smells a bit cleaner, I suppose. The air smells a little bit fresher than... Perhaps, oh, here comes some zebra, everybody. They're coming down to the water now. It's, it's unfamiliar in many ways, Miss Lynn, so it's difficult to describe. But there is that dust in the air. We had a very windy night last night. And very little in the way. I was, went for a walk this early morning uh, and watched the sunrise on the side of the mountain, on the side of that great escarpment I showed you, the edge of the Rift Valley, if you can believe it. And there was a very nice sort of flowery smell because up there it's in amongst the trees it's quite well sort of thicketed the kind of place that Karula and her ilk would like to live now let's see what these zebra do now we've watched a few zebra come down to drink and they have just drunk they haven't crossed I haven't seen a zebra take a bath today yet but here we now have some movement from the rest of the herd everyone they're moving down towards the water And as I say that, do you know what else I can smell, Miss Lynn, is the smell of this river. And I wouldn't describe it as a smell of pristine spring water, but it is a smell of an African river. There's a lot of silt in it, and it's sort of dark and ominous under the surface, but it is life-giving. Because all of the animals here must drink water. There are no artificial water points like there are in the Sabi sand, for example. So all of these animals must come and drink from the perennial Mara River. Let me just say that again. We are sitting, broadcasting live from the banks of the Mara River. Isn't that amazing? Hello Robin, you want to know about those zebra and whether they have a shadow stripe. The further north you go from sunny, gorgeous South Africa, the less that shadow stripe is in evidence. So these ones have got virtually no shadow stripe. You'll see one or two who've got a fairly clear shadow stripe, but you'll see just as many that don't have any. The other thing I've noticed about these zebra while we've been here, and while we look, ooh, it looks like this herd might come down to drink now, or indeed take the plunge. Um, the other thing is that many of the zebra here seem to have fairly Roman noses. They've got a very distinctive kind of uh, roundedness about them. Here we go. Oh, they're right at the edge now. Now, when we got down here, a few of them were where they are now, but there wasn't this great ground swell of support. We had a question during our Facebook Live time earlier today about whether or not there is a leader in the herd. 
and there is not. And that is why there is this indecision. This, everybody, is democracy at work. Everybody has their say, and eventually everyone will decide what to do. There will be a consensus, and one will take the first plunge, and then the rest will follow. And then we'll see what happens. Will a great ancient reptile leap from the deep and grab one? Will they make it across so that they may eat the grass that is, um, to my mind, in the same greenness as it is on that side? Here we go, here we go. Oh, 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 oh. Maybe there. You see, two or three nearly went. Ah, Steve, you want to know what the beautiful tree in the distance is, Steve? I have to say, ashamedly, I'm not 100% sure, but I think it is a boskia tree, which means it's a member of the shepherd's bush family. I climbed one earlier today, obviously, and I sat there just before lunch, and I think that's what it is. It's a stunning tree, isn't it? The way the light is catching it is just too beautiful. Now, the indecision, I'm afraid, of the wildebeest has meant that they have now decided to turn around again. What you can't see here, everyone, is that there is a crocodile, a very large one, the same size as this behemoth this side. There's a very large one sitting the other side of the bank, exactly opposite to where those wildebeests were standing and thinking about crossing. And I think they're a little bit nervous of being eaten by him. Now, while we wait and see, I want to show you something else that we haven't seen or that we don't see there at Juma. Let's just see if I can spot it again. A, and then B, if I can point it out to Graham. It's moved. I'm just scanning the planes with my binoculars. But no, it was an olive baboon. So there's a baboon species here called the olive baboon. Looks very similar to our chakmar baboon. But it's got, the males have got a rather more impressive sort of, um, uh, I called it a mane earlier, but Peter Brat told me I was talking nonsense. So, but I'm going to call it a mane for lack of a better term. It's not quite a mane. It's like a sort of enlarged beard, if you like. Now you can see one of them has lain down. He's got very tired with the democracy that's going on here. He thinks it's rather ridiculous. Hello, Tucker. You're just four years old. Hello, is this your first trip to Kenya? It's my first trip to Kenya, and I hope you're having a good time here in Kenya with me. Um, you say, are they going to take a swim? Well, yes and no. You know, they're not going to swim just because they want to swim, because it's hot, or, you know, to play in the water like you might. They're going to jump into the water, and then they're going to get to try and come to the other side. But that's very dangerous because they're crocodiles in the water. And, you know, we've seen two or three on the banks, but many of them will hide under the water and it's almost impossible to see them. And that's why they're so scared. You can see them coming close to the water, then they stop and they go back again, they come close to the water, and so they don't really know what to do. And some of them are getting a bit tired and they're lying down over there while they wait for perhaps the more... Uh, the older ones or the more experienced ones to decide whether they should go across or not. And there are lots and lots of people around here, everybody, I must say. <laughs> Hello, Anna Marie. I'm just going to ask Graham to let go of the camera just in case he gets a shudder of tears as I tell him what you have said. You've said that Graham Wallington makes dreams come true. Well, that is rather true, isn't it? I've never been here before, and it's an absolute dream come true to be standing right here watching these unbelievable scenes unfolding in front of us, and hopefully they will become slightly more unbelievable as the wildebeest decide whether or not to cross. There's a bit of a breeze blowing in there. That the direction we're looking at now, everyone, is north. Ooh, there's a bit, ooh, there's a bit of movement here. I think he's going to roll. No, he's just doing a 20-meter circle. 
as per a seemingly invisible dressage test set him by one of his friends. I can now hear them bleating. No, 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 no. There's an air of expectation now, there really is. So you're looking out to the north there pretty much everyone and you may see that the sky seems to be turning slightly greyer. I wonder what the we I have no idea what the weather is going to do here. Now Mimi, 15 years old, you ask a very good question about an animal that is, could possibly be more than a hundred years old. And you want to know, the crocodile gets hungry, or if it, if, will it kill again if it isn't hungry, if it's eaten? The answer is no, Mimi, it won't. Crocodiles can sometimes go for two years without food, believe it or not. So if they eat a wildebeest, then they don't need to eat for a long, long time. And the fact that there is a dead wildebeest next to us that nothing is eating tells me that I think this is probably quite a good time for those wildebeest to pop across here. And we're just that zebra thinking about perhaps having a bit of a drink. Hello Kirsten from Denmark as opposed to the final control. Um, you want to know, can we get across the river, or do we go across the river? You can, there are a few crossing points, but it's a different kind of park there, so you've got to sort of pay an entry fee to go in there, which is perfectly normal. And because we have 350 square miles, or 510 square kilometers of land here, there's no need for us to go across the river. I'm just pointing out what looks to be another familiar friend from Juma, it looks like a yellow-eyed canary. Oh, no, that doesn't that looks like a zebra, doesn't it? Yes, that looks like a zebra. The, the canary is just in this bushel over here. And you, there it is, you've got him, middle frame. Up a bit. There we go, keep going. Up a bit, that's him. Yeah, that's him. There he is. A lemon splodge. I think that's, that's probably the yellow-fronted canary, everyone. <laughs> the birds here, there are lots of different birds, and I was just been looking underneath the feet of those wildebeests there. There, Graham, I'm <laughs> can you see the lapwing there? <laughs> there, there it is. There's a lapwing, everybody. I don't know what lapwing that is. I'm going to find out for you right now. Well, I'll ask Peter to maybe find out. He's staring down that way. See if we can find out what lapwing that is for you while we wait for these birds to move. Not birds. Um, what are they called again, Graham? Birds. Wildebeest, that's what it is. Oh, that's right, yeah. Lapwing. Right, here we go. Um, Aaron, you want to know if we get brown hyena here? Um, I don't actually know the answer to that. I think you probably do. You certainly get something called an artfark, which is not an artfark, an artwolf, which is a small hyena, and you also potentially, but unlikely, to see something called a, um, a striped hyena, which is a very small hyena. Now that lapwing, everybody, as far as I can make it out, is called a spur-winged lapwing. That's quite special. First one I've ever seen. I'm getting yips from the back here. Um, Peter Brat, budding ornithologist, in fact more than budding ornithologist, agrees with me, a spur-winged lapwing. Mm, is that it? <laughs> My earphones have come apart, I'm just refixing them to themselves, and I'm back. Right. Now, what else can we see here while we wait for these indecisive beasts? Yeah, there seems to be some movement again. 
Erica, you want to know if they've got forest elephants here. Erica, they don't. Forest elephant, of course, a species found in the real forests. So, I mean, they're found in the forests of Central African Republic, um, and down into the Congo, into uh, Gabon, where Brent has been, and that's where Brent spent quite a lot of time with them. So they're found in the Congo Basin, where there is a vast forest area. Here, here you can see not many trees in sight, and so it would be an appropriate habitat. Let's have one last look at these wildebeest and see if this current movement doesn't bring them down to the bank. And if it doesn't, we'll hand you back to South Africa, and we'll probably sit here for a bit longer. And Scott sounds like he's having a fantastic game drive, and we will see you a little bit later.